Yes, I am. I'm going to talk about heat waves. In fact, I'm going to talk about heat waves in the Australian region in particular. So let's begin by just asking, well, just looking at the Australian natural hazards. And just to sort of set the scene, there we go. This is the, these are Australian natural hazards extreme heat, floods, tropical cyclones, grass fires, etc. So you see the list here and you see the number of deaths over the period 1900 to 2010 and right at the top is extreme heat which comes as a, well, comes as a surprise to, to many people and in fact the total number of deaths is, is basically a half of all the deaths in that, that uh, period from natural hazards. So, fr so uh, from a, a society perspective extreme heat is the number one natural hazard. Much more than tropical cyclones, Hamish. <laughs> That's right. We're number one, right? <laughs> but what is a heat wave? You know, there's, there's so many d definitions that are used in literature. You have to be super careful about this. And what I've done here, I don't expect you to read this table. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go through every line in this table. But my point is, these are just some of the recent, um, I guess, characteristics people have used to define uh, extreme heat. So, for example, up here we've got the worst three-day event, the, the hottest three consecutive nights in the year. Uh, we've got exceedances of a certain, well, the, the, uh, the 97.5th uh, uh, percentile for three days. Um, exceeding 40.6 degrees, uh, periods of at least six days where the maximum temperature exceeds the 90th percent on a calendar day. The details aren't important. My point, the point I'm making is there's a lot of different ways of thinking about heat waves and they matter. I'm not going to spend much time in this talk, in fact virtually no time in this talk, talking about these defini different definitions. In rough terms, I think we're, um, the work that we've done in the centre and colleagues in the centre have done, roughly it boils down, we, we're defining a heat wave as something like three consecutive days where the temperature exceeds the 90th percentile. So in other words, you might think of a particular day and you ask, oh, what's the 90th percentile for this day? 40 degrees, whatever it is, oh, it's going to be less than that. And if, the, if for three days in a row the temperature exceeds that, that ninth percentile, plus maybe some other criteria, but fundamentally that's the, the definition of the heat wave that I'll use in this talk. That three days in a row that you have some extreme heat. So at least three days in a row. But, my, but, but notice there's lots of different definitions and they do matter. What I'm going to do now is going to look at some of the, sort of the bald statistics of, of heat waves and then we'll move on to actually how do they work? How do we get these prolonged periods of heat? I think you might be surprised. It's, it's actually quite a lot more complicated than you might first think. So let's look at uh, some what I'll call heat wave statistics. And at the bottom of each of my slides I've got the reference uh, of, from where I've taken these. These, these pictures. So this is a climatology of Australian heat wave characteristics based on a, a data set called AWAP. Many people here will know what I mean by that and if you don't it doesn't matter, just grid of data. And here we have the frequency of, the, of, of heat wave days, the duration of the longest heat wave, day, uh, heat wave the intensity, it's got these funny units of, of just degrees squared. Um, it's because the, the way they've done the definition here, it's, a, it's sort of a measure of this 90th percentile and another, another measure of how hot it was relative to the previous 30 days and they've taken the product of the two to give a, a, <laughs> a degree squared. It might have been sensible to take the square root, right? But they don't do that. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We can cope. And this is the onset of the first day of the heat wave from the 1st of November. So the main, the main points they're making here is that the frequency of heat wave days, um, so the frequency of heat waves, you know, what do we got here? We've got numbers in the range, five to six over the, over the continent. We've got numbers here, what's the, what's the longest? Well, the reds here are like sevens and the greens are like fives. What's the intensity in terms of degrees squared? Here it's like 40, so let's call that 
square root of that, let's call it six-ish. In Victoria, maybe it's you know, down to three-ish. And onset from the 1st of November, well, what's Christmas? That's sort of 60 days past the 1st of November. So here we're talking about sort of early January onset. That's what we would have guessed, right? What's the relationship with ENSO? So this is a correlation, and it's, a cor and it's how well, a, it's the correlation between uh, the state of ENSO the, uh, and the frequency of, of heat waves, the longest heat wave, the, this measure of the amplitude, and the onset. And reds are uh, positive correlations and blues are negative correlations. And we see a, basically a positive correlation throughout most of Australia. So the frequency of heat waves are possibly correlated with ENSO. So, except down here near the, the, the coast of South Australia and near um, the southern part of Victoria where it's actually, you get more heat waves during the La Nina. And we know why that is, and I'll come back to that a bit later on. And, 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 so, and, and then there's this, this um, so there's the, what you would expect this, this um, positive correlation, that's fine too. And this is the correlation with the antecedent soil moisture. And what they mean by this is they look at the soil moisture in the winter and autumn preceding the summer and ask how well is the, the, are these measures of heat waves correlated with the soil moisture. And here we get a negative correlation. So in other words, more heat waves when it's drier, etc. So I, I think that these statistics that we see here, if we had to guess, that's pretty much what we, our gut feeling might have been, right? This is a, the recent trends in heat waves. This is the trend in the number of heat wave days between November and March. Um, and the units are days per decade. And so over much of the continent, we've seen an increase in heat waves of about, let's call it a day per decade. We probably would have guessed that one as well. Maybe not the numbers, but the, this was the general idea. All right. Now, that's, that's sort of set the scene for us. How do heat waves really work? Why do we get heat waves? What gives us these prolonged periods of heating? And it turns out we need to know about Rosby waves. Okay, that's going to be a key ingredient to, to heat waves. So this is the argument, I'm going to go through the argument that everybody who's done any dynamics, this would be the introductory dynamics explanation of, of, of Rosby waves. These waves that propagate in the, in the atmosphere and are really the, the building blocks for, um, for weather. But if you think about it, there are really three kinds of waves in the atmosphere. There are sound waves, which we don't think are very important for weather or climate. There are gravity waves or buoyancy waves which we think are important for weather but not climate. And then there are synoptic waves, Rosby waves, these waves which we're going to talk about now which are absolutely important for the weather. They're the building blocks of the weather. And the idea is this. So the mathematical idea is this is the, this is the absolute vorticity. That's the vorticity, zeta, and f is the planetary vorticity, the Coriolis parameter. 2 omega times the sine of the latitude. And this says that the, the vorticity, the absolute vorticity, is conserved, the rate of change is zero. It's conserved following fluid parcels. In other words, if I start take a parcel there here and I follow it, whatever it's f plus zeta was there, it's the same over here. It hasn't changed. Or in other words, f, let's think about a beta plane, F equals F naught, the Coriolis parameter, plus beta y. Beta is the north-south gradient in the planetary vorticity. F naught, so what does this tell us? We start out with, at a, with a particular value, we end up with the same value. Or, or a subscript zero, the other way around. Start off with a particular value, we end up with a particular value, same value. If we rearrange this expression, we get that zeta a equals zeta naught plus beta y minus ya. What this is saying is this. If I take a parcel there, and I push it towards the north, or I push it towards the south, 
That's what this, this is telling us here, that it's, it's displacement. Its displacement determines its vorticity, its, its rotation. That's because the vorticity changes, the planetary vorticity changes from the pole to the equator. At the equator, it's zero. At the poles, it's a maximum. So let's look at this diagram here. This red line, for example. Y points towards the north, X points towards the east. Suppose we take a line of, of, of fluid parcels and air, air, and we push some north and we push some south. Some get pushed north, some get pushed south. Some get, get, get pushed, pushed north, etc. Those that get pushed north in the southern hemisphere take a parcel, move it towards the north, the equator, it finds itself in a less cyclonic region. Those that get moved toward the south find themselves in a more cyclonic region. Because the absolute vorticity is conserved, those that are pushed towards the north, more cyclonic, acquire a circulation in this sense, cyclonic in the, in the southern hemisphere is that. Those that come towards the pole, anticyclonic, like this. <laughs> this is the basic theory of Rosby waves. It's this kind of wave on a vorticity gradient. And this wave gets propagates towards the west. If there's a background flow, it then moves towards the east, if the background flow is la large enough. So this, this is the, the sort of the fundamental, this is the textbook, sort of undergraduate textbook theory of Rossby waves. I'll let you into a, a secret here. It's actually not correct. And it's not correct for the following reason, because it assumes that all the gradients in, in the vorticity that are important are associated with the north-south gradient in the, in the planetary vorticity. The difference between the rotation at the equator versus the pole. It turns out that really Rosby waves prop propagate along jets. And they propagate along jets because it's the gradient, the gradients associated with the jets that are most important. In fact, far more important than beta. You could throw beta away and it wouldn't make any difference, really. All right, so we've, we've, we've gone through some of the theory. And for some of you, this will be, yeah, I've seen this lots of times before, and for some people, it'll be new. But whatever, doesn't matter. Let's, let's, what are the consequences of this? Now, this has got nothing to do with, or well, not true, it has a lot to do with heat waves, but this is not a picture about heat waves. This is about Rosby waves. And this is a composite picture of about, I don't know, 400... Rosby waves, lots of them. And I won't tell you how we've composited them, I'll just show you the answer. So this is, in the, in the top panel here, these solid green lines are ice attacks at um, 350 Kelvin, that's about 200 millibars in the upper part of the atmosphere. So this is the summertime jet. And notice in Australia we live at the end of the jet. These colours represent those anomalies in the vorticity. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Cyclonic, anticyclonic, cyclonic, anticyclonic. In the bottom panel, these are, this is probably a picture that you might be more familiar with, the, the, the contours represent the anomalies in the geopotential height. So in other words, we've got a negative anomaly here, a low, relative low, relative high, relative low. Around the low, in the southern hemisphere, Cyclone, clockwise flow, anticyclone, anticlockwise flow. And the, 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 the colours represent the meridional component of the wind, the north-south wind. So around this, this upper low here, we have a northerly, southerly, northerly, southerly. Now, we call this a Rosby wave packet because you can see we have this wavy structure, but it's confined in, the, in its sort of zonal extent. It's confined to this region here. Now, minus four days, if we go four today, oop, the wave is propagated further towards Australia. Zero is propagated even further towards Australia. These are the structures that are responsible for our weather, Rosby waves. Notice the way in which it's propagating from South America towards Australia. This happens all the time. We, just, we get these structures that propagate along the jet towards Australia, and they're refracted towards the equator. Rosby waves are refracted in just the same kind of way as lights refracted, the other sorts of uh, waves. So they're sort of the same 
Rossby waves, though, are refracted by variations in the temperature in the wind field. But there's still a kind of a, these same kind of wave effects um, uh, occur. Anyway, the main point I want to make is this. The waves are propagated along the jet towards Australia and are refracted poleward. Here's another point I want to make, and this is an important point. This is the low levels at day zero, and in this in here uh, we have the 800 millibar geopotential height anomalies. So a high, low, high, low, and the red represents diabatic heating anomalies. In other words, heating. In fact, heating due to convection or latent heat release. So it's an anomaly. You notice it goes from way down here right up into the tropics. You may wonder what this has got to do with heat waves. It turns out a lot, actually. A lot. Right, so what we've seen, so all I'm do, what I'm doing with these slides here is either telling you or refreshing your memory, Rosby waves are the central animals that control our weather. They propagate along the jet. They're associated with gradients in the vorticity. And as they approach Australia, they also seem to produce heating anomalies, diabetic heating anomalies, the anomalies associated with, uh, with, with latent heat release. This is the subset of those days for, for heat waves. And this is the day prior to a heat wave. And the day prior to a heat wave, we see a very clear Rosby wave packet. So this is at upper levels. Uh, the wave pack is propagated along the jet. Northerlies ahead, uh, southerlies back here. Northerlies, southerlies. All right, so heat waves are also associated with Rosby waves. And this is a composite of about, I don't know, maybe 100 different events. I come from, can't remember exactly. There's lots of them. They, they all look like this. For those of you who know a little bit about dynamics, I'm going to say, I want to say a few more things for those of you who don't. Well, don't worry, we're going to we'll move on a little bit. I want to, one of the central uh, in, uh, ideas in modern dynamical meteorology is potential vorticity. And we, we often use this quantity to characterise weather systems, and it's particularly useful in thinking about heat waves. And the reason we use this quantity is it kind of controls the, the dynamics. A knowledge of this quantity, that's it for, for the larger scale dynamics. It's sort of a generalisation of this expression up here. It says that the rate of change of the potential vorticity is zero. It's conserved, provided the flow is inviscid and adiabatic. And it can be written this way. Here's the absolute vorticity, F plus zeta. And it's divided through by a, what looks a bit like, if you tip, tip this up to tan, down, took the reciprocal, if you theta by dp, that would be a static stability. I've written it this way because for those of you who've done some, some, some meteorology or dynamics, this looks like the shallow water equations. The, the absolute vorticity divided by a distance. This is a measure of the distance between two isentropic surfaces. The static stability tells you how you know, how the potential temperature changes with height. So large static stability means the isentropes are close together, and a weak static stability means that they're far apart. So it is a kind of a measure of the distance between of isentropic surfaces. So what this is saying is as isentropes are far apart, if you, st you stretch the, the, the vortex column, you spin up the, you provide a, you produce a cyclonic circulation, you compress it, you produce an anticyclonic circulation. All right. For those who, who, know, who don't know about that sort of stuff, this is a climatology of this quantity, this important quantity. And you'll see why it's important in a few moments. This comes from a book by Howie Bluestein. This is pressure, the log of pressure, so that's height. And this is latitude. This is the North Pole, and this is the South Pole. And let's just look at this, the, this, the South Pole. The dashed lines are contours of that quantity I just talked about, the potential vorticity. And <coughs> this is a time mean over 10 years and a zonal mean. So we just have a, a north-south 
height section. Notice the, 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 the contours are all bunched together up here. That's sort of the modern definition of the stratosphere. The stratosphere is where the potential vorticity exceeds a certain value because there's a, a big reservoir of this stuff. It's a whole bunch of this stuff sitting in the stratosphere. And the troposphere is sort of the region below where it's not that big. So you might think of the atmosphere as sort of like a two-layer stratosphere where the potential vorticity is large and a troposphere where the potential vorticity is small. This is going to be important. These contours, these flat contours, are the isentropes, the potential temperature. The potential temperature, you may remember the potential temperature. Theta equals T, 1000 divided by P to the R over CP. It's a bit like a temperature, but it's conserved following adiabatic motion, that is motion where the, we neither heat nor cool the, the atmosphere. So 350 is going to be an important one. And notice it's kind of flat. And notice that over here, it's in the troposphere. And over here, it's in the stratosphere. So if I, if I, flat, if I walked along this isentropic surface from the pole, I walked from the pole towards the equator, I'd be in the stratosphere. Walking from here, from the pole towards the equator, I'm in the stratosphere. Get to this point where it changes to low values of PV, I'm in the troposphere. This is the pre-Black Saturday, this is the P potential vorticity on the pre-Black Saturday heat wave, the biggest heat wave you know, over, over southern Australia ever. Let's spend some time looking at this. This is the 350K isentropic surface. So in other words, let's go back to the mean. I'm on this surface here, and I'm plotting the potential vorticity on this surface. Where I'm in the stratosphere, I expect it to be large and negative. Where it's in the troposphere, I expect it to be small and negative. And this, is, this black line is this boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere. It's wiggly, as you'd expect. The colours here mean that they're large and negative, and the, white light, white <laughs> the whites mean that it's small and negative. Two really important things. Notice how this, this stratospheric air is being pulled out and is wrapping around southern Australia. It's wrapping around in this sense, an anti-cyclonic sense. What's happened is that Rosby waves, which are undulations on this boundary, propagate, we've seen this in the mean, propagate towards Australia, and under some conditions they get so large they start to break, like waves break on the beach. When we think about a wave on the beach, right, what happens there? The wave is propagating towards the beach, and the, and the water gets shallower and shallower and shallower, so it's kind of like the energy per unit depth, if you like, gets larger and larger. Eventually the thing overturns, like this. This is very similar, but the overturning is in the horizontal rather than in the vertical. And the overturning is continental scale. So stratospheric air is being pulled out towards the, 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 the poles, uh, the tropics. Tropospheric air is being ingested in here towards the pole. This is the big upper anticyclone. This is a upper trough. Just as an aside, we tend to, th these days, meteorologists tend to think of weather systems in these terms. When a bit of the stratosphere breaks off and wanders around like this, that's what a cutoff cyclone is. Mm -hmm. So we can see, we can see the, the connection between, or well maybe you can't quite yet, but you can see that at least the pattern of this breaking wave is an important part of the formation of this upper anticyclonic anomaly. So, for example, let's take all the heat waves over southeastern Australia for the last 30 or 40 years and composite them, take an average of this picture, and what do we get? So this is the anomaly. So in other words, if you took this, took the mean, and subtracted the mean, this is what you'd get. So the first thing you notice is this big anticyclonic anomaly, this red region. That's the hole here. It's more anticyclonic than it would otherwise be. You've displaced the stratosphere on this isentropic surface. And it's surrounded by this horseshoe of cyclonic PV. That's this, this, this. This is a composite of, I don't remember how many exactly, um, maybe it's 40 or 50 heat waves. 
right? So it's a, it's a, they all have this kind of this kind of pattern. The other thing to notice is I'm talking a lot about what's going on at upper levels. We think, well, <laughs> shouldn't we be talking about what's going on at the surface? We're talking about heat waves. We'll come back to that, that in a moment. There's a great focus in the, in the theory of heat waves on the upper levels and not the surface. Come back to that later on. So this is the characteristic picture. The tropopause, at least in the, the composite <coughs> mean, it's flat and it sort of starts to curl, curl, curl over. In an individual case, you can see the tropopause is just really, really broken and curl, curled, curved over. Whereas in the mean, it's sort of smeared out a bit, but you can still see that same sort of pattern. So individual heat waves look, look like that's the extreme version, and this is the composite mean version, but that's what, that's what they look like. All right, so that's one of the characteristic features. And if I take a cross section through that anomaly, right, the north-south section, what would it look like? Well, the north-south section looks like this, and the left-hand panel is the most important of the two. The, uh, the ordinate here is, uh, lo is the pressure, log of the pressure, so it's basically height. And this is the north-south, the, the medianal dist um, the, the latitude, rather. The solid lines are isentropes. The red is the PV anomaly, the, vortistic, the potential vorticity anomaly, vorticity anomaly if you like. And the, these circular or elliptical uh, regions, this is, this is the zonal wind. So this is easterlies and there's a westerlies. The first thing that hits you in the face is that the anomalies, the, the real anomaly is largest in the upper atmosphere. Even though we're talking about heat waves, something that's important to the surface, look, the, the, the defining feature is this big stratospheric anomaly in the PV. Now, the people who've done some dynamics before will know that an, an anomaly like this, an anticyclonic anomaly, has an anticyclonic circulation around it, something like that. The same way as a, an anticyclone has a circulation which is anticlockwise. So for that reason, we have easterlies on this side and westerlies on that side. Notice the maxima are where the anomaly is largest. Right? A, big, a big anomaly, anticyclonic anomaly, anticyclonic circulation around it. But it's not just confined to the stratosphere, it's also felt all the way through the troposphere, almost towards the surface. Now we're starting to, 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 to see what's happening at the surface, to some degree. The, the, the straight lines are the isentropes, and they're pretty flat through here. This is the stratosphere, and then this is the troposphere. I'll just point out that these easterlies are subsiding. This is subsidence, and this is rising motion. All right. Of course, this is omega, for those you know that about this stuff. All right, now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to stick with... This is, this is really what I'm going to, well, this is my contention. This is how heat waves work. And I'll come back and I'll fill in the details. So, so far, here we have Australia. Here we have a big upper anticyclonic anomaly. This is a schematic. Where does the, where does the air come from that forms this upper anticyclonic anomaly? Where does the air come from that forms this low level anomaly, whatever that is, the heat wave? How are they connected? I've also made the, the I kind of, I've implied that clouds are important, that convection's important through latent heating, where the Rossby waves approach the uh, Australia, they produce heating, and somehow that's important. And I think it is. And I've also made the, I've kind of touched on this subsiding motion near the anticyclone. This, in a sense, is the most important ingredient of all. All right, now, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to kind of pick apart each of these little, th these, each of these features. Roger waves come along and they set up this kind of picture. Now this is, um, so what, where does this anticyclone come from? So what we've done is we've taken, for every heat wave over southern Australia, we've We've said, where's the upper anticyclone? Oh, there it is. Let's take some air parcels and w ask where they come from, do some back trajectories. Tens and tens of thousands of them. 
10,000 10, per heat wave or something like that. We're going to do the same for the surface. So we start here and say, where does the air come from? Now, 72 hours before, it looks like this. The colours represent the height of the trajectories and the, the contours represent the density, so where are most of the, the trajectories congregated. So most of the, the trajectories at this point have, have aggregated over the southwestern corner of the continent. Remember, we're talking about heat waves over southeastern Australia. And many of the, the, the trajectories are blue, meaning they're in the upper part of the troposphere. This is the, their height, their pressure height, 200, 300, 400, 500 millibars. But many of them are near the surface still, 1,000 millibars. So the question is, they've got to get from the surface into the upper anticyclone. They've got to form, how do they do that? Well, convection's part of the story here. So I'm going to call these ones that are already at the level of the anticyclone the cooling branch for reasons that I'm not going to go into at the moment. And I'm going to call the low-level ones the heating branch. And so this is the, a time series of these two families of air, air parcels. So this is time running along the abscissa. This is height. This is time specific humidity. Time potential temperature. Time cloud fraction. For the ones that have started off in the upper part of the atmosphere and those that are close, closer to the surface of the Earth. So at this point we're at m minus 72 hours. Let's think about these ones that were uh, not that far from the, the surface. The, the vertical lines here represent the distance between the 25th and the 75th percentiles. In other words, it gives you kind of a measure of the spread. Remember, this is not just one trajectory. This is 10,000 trajectories. So we're just getting some measure of the spread of these trajectories. So, and the parcels start to ascend in the latest 48 hours. And as they ascend, their potential temperature increases by more than 10 degrees. That's the signature of these parcels being lofted in convection. Now we're talking about heat waves here, so say, but it's, it's looking like heating, convective heating is important for heat waves. Whereas these other branches, they just, they just sort of vectored straight into the, the upper anticyclone. Uh, the increase in cloud fraction as well and drying are also indicative of convection. So just to sort of follow this theme about the convection and its, and its um, connection to the formation of the upper anticyclone, if we look at upper anticyclones, upper PV anomalies, and we look at the largest upper anticyclones, we choose a, a family of all very large upper anticyclones defined in a particular way. And we ask, there's a some of them are associated with heat waves, and some of them are not associated with heat waves. Let's split them into two, two categories. This is the ones that are not associated with heat waves, and this is the ones that are. And what we're plotting is the precipitation. And there's a clear difference in precipitation anomaly for heat waves. So the heat wave is here where we have the, uh, the upper anticyclone is here, we have the precipitation deficit. But it's, there's a ring of fire around it. There's lots of precipitation on its equatorward flank, lots of precipitation on its poleward flank, lots of precipitation through here. Whereas upper anticyclones, which might be equally strong, on average are a bit str less strong actually, precipitation not organised at all. That's a strange thing. It's a strange thing. Oh, sorry, I've pressed the wrong button. Let me go back. In my glasses, sorry. All right, so this is, this is sort of further evidence of the importance of the convection. More evidence. This is days of the, uh, days in DJF between 89 and 2009, and this is the phase of the MJO. You know about the MJO? It's just, uh, so there's a sort of an envelope of convection that starts out in the the western part of the Indian Ocean and it propagates towards the uh, maritime continent and propagates into the Pacific and starts to die and then the, the signal's thought to propagate around again and start it and you start off with another packet of convection that propagates across the Indian Ocean. And the phase of the MJO, this is telling you where you are in the globe. It turns out that 
This region here, about four or thereabouts, three, four, about four, is the maritime continent. So the point is that the convection in the tropics could be in any, if you just take a, randomly take a day, it could be in any phase. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The phase of MGO is basically equally likely. If you say, I have a heat wave, what's the phase of the MJO? It's preferentially about three, four, which is exactly convection here. All right. What's more, this, this is, um, I'm actually going to tell you the result, we're not, lots of detail. This is the Black Saturday heat wave, and there was a tropical cyclone here, TC Dominic. Turns out there's quite often tropical cyclones in that region when we have heat waves in south, uh, south of Western Australia. We have it, and the, in tropical cyclones, I, don't, I wouldn't place too much, much on it being a tropical cyclone. It just means it's big tropical convection. So what happens is that the big convection here, there's two things. Tropical cyclones, as, as, as Hamish told us, the circulation is in, up, and out. Cyclonic at low levels and anticyclonic at upper levels. Two things happen. One, this anticyclonic circulation is advected into the anticyclone over here. And two, the outflow from the tropical cyclone pushes the jet around and helps this process of breaking, this overturning. So by big convection, outflow pushes the jet, shakes the jet if you like, amplifies the Rosby wave, that's one thing, helps the wave overturn. And the other thing is you actually take part of this anticyclonic circulation and you just advect it into the upper anticyclone. All right. So let's go back. I've emphasised the upper anticyclone. I've hardly said anything about the surface processes. And if you look at the literature, that's probably the same in the literature as well. We emphasise the upper anticyclone uh, over the surface. Let's now look at the surface. What's going on at the surface? Well, the first, the first thing I'd say is, the meteorologists here, meteorologists here will know this, but not everyone will. At the leading edge of this anticyclone, we would expect to see subsidence. The stronger the anti, uh, well, amongst other things, the stronger the anticyclone, the stronger the subsidence. And that's, the, that's the, the important connection to the surface. Let's look at the origin of the near surface parcels. So let's start with the heat wave and we'll take you know, 10,000 partic particles and say, oh, where did they come from? Like, well, the first thing is, this is, the, this is the schematic, but notice they come from the northwest, they turn anticyclonically and they end up over the, the southern ocean. Or they begin over the Southern Ocean, if you wish. At minus 44 hours, this is the pattern. At minus 72 hours, this is the pattern. Same as before. The colours represent the height. So blues are in the, the sort of the middle part of the troposphere, and the reds are now right near the surface. And the contours represent the density of the trajectories. So more trajectories, more contours. So at this time, at minus 144 hours, are uh, here the particles that are going to end up near the surface as part of this heat wave are actually over the ocean. Not over the central part of the continent, over the ocean. Right? There are some over the central part of the continent, but at low levels they're over the ocean, at upper levels they're over here, to, over the ocean still, but south of South Western Australia. Three days before the heat wave itself, the, the, the air parcels um, con have congregated over the ocean and on the east coast of the continent. Here they are. They're not over here, are they? They're over there. Let's look at the thermodynamic history of these parcels. So, this is the height versus time, the potential temperature versus time, and the temperature versus time. The height. The, the black line is the mean, and the bars represent the 75th to 25th percentile. So you can see some spread, how the spread in these trajectories. And what's happening? The parcels are descending. I talked about subsidence, didn't I? I said that subsidence is going to be really important. What happens when parcels subside? They go from uh, low pressure 
to high pressure. They are compressed. And if they're compressed, they warm. They warm through adiabatically. So we're not heating the parcel through radiation or whatever, latent heating. Just squeeze up the, squeeze the EMS up, you increase the temperature. That's the first law of the, well, that's a consequence of the first law of thermodynamics. If we calculate the potential temperature, notice it's flat and then around about 48 hours or a bit before that, it starts to increase. Remember, and one way of writing the first law of thermodynamics is that d theta by dt equals, I'll just say heating here, or cooling. If there's no heating or cooling, no latent, heat, uh, no latent heating, no radiation, whatever, at zero, then the potential temperature is conserved. It doesn't change. It can only change through diabetic processes. Take the Bunsen burner to it, you know. <laughs> Allow condensation, whatever. So for the most of the trajectory, the, uh, the air parcels don't, their, their temperature doesn't change, their potential temperature doesn't change. And then at some point it does. So now we're talking about diabetic processes. What are we talking about? Maybe convection, boundary layer heating, we'll have a look. The temperature, now even though the potential temperature um, is conserved, the actual temperature, theta is conserved, the temperature changes because P is changing. We're compressing the, the parcel. So the temperature changes and it changes relatively linearly through most of the period and about this line here it starts to go up fast. This is the, I'll call this the adiabatic part. This is the part of the temperature change due to the compression of the part of the air, air parcels. And it's about 20 degrees. This part is the diabetic part, the part due to, let's say, heating in the boundary layer. It's about five degrees. In other words, the heating the boundary layer and the surface fluxes heating the air adjacent to it maybe accounts for five degrees, whereas the subsidence, which is forced by the upper anticyclone, accounts for four times that in rough terms. Mm -hmm. And that is why we emphasize the upper anticyclone, because most of the heating actually comes from the upper anticyclone, the subsidence. What's more, if we take these parcels and we, ca and we follow them around and we ask, what is the surface sensible heat flux? So, 40, at minus 48 hours, this is, a, this is the, the surface sensible heat flux over Australia. Um, and this is the surface sensible heat flux at, uh, at the time of the heat wave. So the shading represents the surface sensible heat fluxes, or well, the anomalies in the surface sensible heat flux. And the black uh, contours rep represent the spatial density of the trajectories. So, 48 hours before the formation of a heat wave over, over Victoria, most of the parcels lie over the eastern, con uh, eastern part of Australia, southern Queensland, New South Wales. So all the parcels are here, the trajectories are here. Where the surface sensible heat flux is anomaly is positive. And this is an anomaly from the seasonal mean. So the parcels are near, are, are in the boundary layer over New South Wales and they're being heated. The day of the heat wave, once they get to Victoria, here they are, but the anomaly in the surface tensile heat flux is negative. Not very negative. Of course it's, the, we, 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 it's summertime, of course we're heating the, the atmosphere. But we're heating it slightly less than we would on average. This kind of suggests that the important sensible heat fluxes are in New South Wales for Victorian heat, heat waves. This is consistent with uh, observations that were taken in the 80s. Uh, there was a big program looking at cold fronts in the 80s, and ahead of cold fronts, so you get something called a warm conveyor belt. It's the northerly airstream that you... And people knew from those observations that the warm conveyor belt had its origins in the boundary layer over New South Wales, even though you're looking at the front over southern Australia. The parcels that are being, uh, that end up in the heat wave of Victoria has their origins in the boundary layer over New South Wales. So what are we seeing? We're seeing the air 
come along like this, out over the ocean, turn anticyclonically over the land. So they, they reached Victoria from, a, uh, from over the land, but they were mostly over the ocean. They're in the boundary layer. There we go. I'm going to show you a, a modelling study which was not done, which was done for rather different reasons. Um, and this is uh, the, an, an experiment looking at the heat wave on Black Saturday. And there's lots of, lots of, lots of little tiny postage stamp panels there. And, and we don't need to look at them all. This group of uh, simulations is when the authors here change the soil moisture five days before the, the target, before the, the heat wave day. They change the soil moisture 10 days before. They change the soil moisture 15 days before. And in the, this top experiment, they decrease the soil moisture by 5%, decrease by 15%, decrease by 25, increase by 5, increase by 15, increase by 25. Let's just look at this red block here. They've changed the soil moisture 10 days before the heat wave on Black, on Black Saturday. And what's happened? They've increased the soil moisture by 25% over the whole of Australia. So whatever the soil moisture was, multiply by 1.25, have increased the temperature over Victoria by 4 or 5 degrees. Not decreased, increased. Right. Now, when they decrease the control temp uh, soil moisture by 25%, you get an increase in the temperature, but it's nowhere near, it's not as strong. All right, so this brings me to the end. So my point is this, that heat waves are more complex, complex beasts than you first imagine. Rosby waves come along, they break, they produce an upper anticyclone. An upper anticyclone is important for a number of reasons. Well, really, there's, there's a couple of reasons, but the most important is that it promotes subsidence. Adiabatic compression compri um, uh, accounts for most of the warming. There is some warming, of course, in the boundary layer, maybe five degrees or thereabouts. About, about 20 of it comes from compression. Convection in the tropics matter. They matter because it reinforces, it strengthens the upper anticyclone. Heat waves, you'll find that the precipitation anomaly is quite different from just ordinary upper anticyclones. There's this ring of fire all the way around it, which is sort of consistent with what I've just said. Now, this is a winter school. School. So I'm going to leave you with a question, which I'm not going to answer, but I want you to think about. You know, those of you who've ever looked at maps of the Australian continent or North Africa or the Middle East, we all know that in summer we develop heat lows. Over North and Western Australia, a big heat low develops. Over the Sahara, a big heat low develops. Over North Eastern Australia, a heat trough. Not a heat anticyclone, a heat low. Over summer, when we heat the, the, near the coast and do nothing to the ocean, we lower the pressure over the, over the land and drive a sea breeze towards the low pressure. Now here's the thing. I and everybody else emphasise, talk about anti-cyclones and heat waves. Why, why aren't they associated with cyclones? And for the dynamicists here, you will know that a, a surface temperature anomaly is equivalent to a surface cyclonic PV anomaly. In other words, there's a cyclonic circulation around a, 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 a warm anomaly. Again, saying the same thing. So my question to you is, what's, why the big deal about anticyclones for heat waves? Have a think about that, and with that, I'll bring it to an end. There's the, the references to the, what I've presented today. Yes. Thank you very much. Very um, I was not sure about, I, I mean, maybe I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. I saw reductions in sensible heat and soil moisture and it's the same thing like, How does that balance the surface fluxes compared to the other So the latent heating, I think, is important not locally but remotely. So I think the important, so when, the, so when you change the soil moisture over Australia, most of the continent is dry. 
and you, 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 whatever you do to it, it's still dry. You increase the soil moisture by 25% or... But in the tropics, that's different. Uh, and so if you increase the soil moisture in the tropics by 25%, you promote convection, I think. I think the authors who did that study, this, is, this wasn't their main, their main uh, aim, so they didn't discuss this. But I think that the convection through here is incredibly important. So, we, so moistening northern Australia, southwestern Australia, um, the part of western Australia, promotes this, this, this convection through here. And what does that do? It reinforces the upper anticyclone. It reinforces it two ways. One by pushing the, 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 the jet around, promoting the wave breaking, and also in up out producing an upper anticyclone, cyclonic or TST or PV that's evicted into the upper anticyclone. So it reinforces the upper anticyclone. That's the importance of the soil moisture. So what you were saying is that the reinforcing of the anti-upper air anticyclone is stronger than, for example, the cooling from precipitation. The precipitation, that happens far away. So, so there's no precipitation here. The precipitation is taking place over there. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so cooling from sub sub, the cooling by the cooling by precipitation is below cloud base. The latent heating is in the cloud. Yeah, I, I know, and I'm saying the same thing. That the heating and the cooling that you were talking about is over here, and it's promoting the upper anticyclone there. It's not over the heat wave. The heat wave is basically clear sky. Yeah, but if if there's convection, but but the, the, the convection comes through at the end of the heat wave. Or I'm not so, I'm, I'm not arguing that there's convection over the region of the heat wave during a heat wave. The convection is remote. So with the important convection, these parcels... I'm confused if it's happening at the cloud level or surface level. So the, any, any, any cooling through, a, through evaporation will be at the surface. Any heating will be at cloud level. But all those processes are in Western Australia. The heat wave is over Victoria. They're separated by 2,000 kilometres. So the, 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 heating is not, the heating is changing the meteorology, it's changing the upper up a cyclone, but it's not directly cooling or heating uh, locally. In your figure, there was a loss of temperature. That's got nothing to do with latent heating. That's to do with if you increase the, the temperature, so if you've got a surface, a surface and above it, you actually warm, you'll change the surface sensible heating. You'll decrease it. Yeah, because it's hotter. No, that's surface sensible heating. <coughs> this is this is the surface sensible heat flux. So how does the negative surface sensible heat cool? That's very warm. It doesn't. I didn't say it doesn't. Okay. This, the positive surface sensible heating is here over New South Wales. This is an anomaly. The negative is here over southern Australia. But that, the, the heat rate, the yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a surface sensible heat flux is decreased by about 10 watts per meter squared or something like that. It's a, it's a small decrease. Well, compared to it, compared to other other processes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what it, as compared it as compared to the mean. The mean is still some large number. I don't, I'm not sure that what it is exactly several hundred, right? So that's the anomaly from the mean. So what it's saying is that it's not the local surface sensible heating that's doing the, the that, that's that's as important. It's remote surface sensible heating. It's remote convection that's important for the setting up the weather pattern. If anything, the local is actually. If anything, the local is actually working in the opposite direction. Exactly. If anything, it's actually it's the opposite. Correct. So from this perspective, the local surf, surf, surface sensible heating it doesn't help, it hinders from this perspective. If you want a heat wave, that is. 
Yes. So you're talking about, so this is talking mostly about the processes leading up to a heat wave. Yeah. What about if you have a multi day heat wave? Do these processes. Heat waves are by definition multi day to start with. So, and, and one of the reasons, that, reasons they're multi day is because of the upper anticyclone. Upper anticyclones can't move on. They're, 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 for reasons that you're nodding your head and you understand. Yeah, so that's part of the, the multi-dayness of, the, of the, the event. One day extremes are a different story, actually, I think. Hmm. Oh, well, we're not going to talk about that today. It's too, it's too long. But I think they're a different story. Uh, yes and yes. So let's start, sorry, here. Uh, yeah, so one uh, thing in the beginning that you were saying that the uh, Rossby waves were traveling uh, towards the north due to refraction. Is it refraction due to the change in Coriolis force or is it due to like, change in topography? No, uh, neither. It's a d so Rossby waves, um, the, the, thing that, the thing that Rossby waves, Rossby waves which would be better called potential vorticity gradient waves. They propagate on that gradient. And in the simple theory, that gradient is the north-south change in the, in the planetary vorticity, beta. But in reality, these structures propagate along jets. And that's because the gradient in the, the PV or the vorticity, that's where it's all concentrated. It's much larger than beta. So where these things propagate is determined by kind of the gradient in PV. And so this is determined by uh, the, the winds and the temperature fields. Mm -hmm. And so the refraction is not due to, to the planetary vorticity or topography, it's due to the internal structure of the, of the atmosphere, the jet stream. Mm. Yeah. Southeastern Australia. Yeah. Um, is it similar processes for WA heat waves? Yeah. What's new with the heat Yeah. All right. So I've talked mostly about Southeastern Australian heat waves for two reasons. One, well, three reasons actually. One, just to keep the thing contained. Two, we've done more work on that. And three, I think they're in some ways more interesting. But I can say that everything I've said is, can be, you can replace Southeastern Australia with Sydney, you can replace it with Tasmania you can replace it with Adelaide. And it's similar but not identical over, the, over, um, over Western Australia. The extent to which convection plays a role, I'm not certain about because I haven't really done those calculations fully. What I can tell you though, um, just while we're at it, Brisbane's actually pretty interesting. In fact, uh, the subtropics become interesting. Do I have a, a 30 seconds? Yeah. Um, now, I just put up some extra slides at the end here. Ah, where are my extra slides? <coughs> ah, here we go. Ah, sorry. <coughs> The slide I want to show you is this one. If you'd play the same sort of game for, for Brisbane, and I know you asked me about Western Australia, and my answer to West, the Western Australia is largely the same, but I can't tell you, that, I can't tell you about the, the diabetic effects because I haven't done the, the calculations to, to be confident with that answer. Okay? I think, it's, I, th I think the answer is it's largely true. I'm going to with that. In Brisbane, if you do a similar sort of, play a similar sort of game, and you think about um, trajectories which have large diabetic temperature changes along them and trajectories which have no diabetic temperature, uh, temperature changes, in other words, adiabatic. You get a swarm of, there's Brisbane there, or, and the, this is the, all the possible trajectories. And here's another way of looking at it, temperature versus potential temperature. There are brown ones, there are green ones, and there are grey ones. We look at the brown and the green ones. The green ones do this start over the ocean, turn anticyclonically and subside into Brisbane. That's the mean of all the green. The mean of all the brown is this one. And the diabatic heating is 
as the, these parcels cross the continent, they're heated diabatically in the boundary layer. So they have a very long fetch across the continent. They're heated as they cross the continent. And when they get to Brisbane, they're, they form part of the, the heat wave. And, and the reason why that can happen is because in, in the subtropics, you don't need much of a temperature perturbation to, to get you above the, 90, the 90th percentile. Only a couple of degrees will do it for you. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I haven't answered your question precisely.